Let's talk about the five canons of rhetoric for public speaking. I often say that 95% of how a presentation turns out is determined by how you prepare. And the five canons of rhetoric explain why that is. These five canons of rhetoric are general principles that we can use to evaluate or judge how our speech preparation is coming along. They originally came to us from, we believe, Cicero. In college, you might even see teachers use versions of these five canons to evaluate student speeches. But I'd like to use them and think about them as a practical five-point speaking guide. I was talking to a friend and former professor of mine Dr. Peter Marston about this, and he said it's helpful for him to think about these five canons as the key choices that we make when we're preparing and delivering a speech. And I want to thank Professor Marston for talking to me and influencing this video as I prepared. So keep in mind that these are choices you make as a speaker. Here are the five canons. Number one, invention. This describes the behind-the-scenes research and thought process of gathering all of your materials, stories, information, and other content you could include in a message. As my friend Professor Marston said, one way to think about invention is to think about the choices you make about the material that you're likely to include in your speech. There are endless possible content choices about what you might include, and you have to sift through all that material and make some decisions. Invention is also about crafting the key argument or central persuasive theme of your message. In the initial stages of preparation, you have numerous angles you could take to make sure your message is at its best for that audience. I was doing a presentation a while back and it was a new message for a new client. And in some ways I had to begin with a persuasive opening to make sure I convinced my listeners that the rest of the workshop was really worth listening to. So I spent more time creating that opening than any other part of the presentation. I had to make choices about the examples and information to include and find my right angle on my point of view that would best resonate with that particular audience. It's up to the speaker to find the best materials and the most convincing way to make our case. Typically, when a presentation comes across as lightweight or thin, that's a sign that the speaker should have invested more time on invention long before they ever stood up. Invention is the first step when you're getting into any new message. Number two, arrangement. Next, speakers need to arrange their argument, main points, and the ideas within those main points so their message has a maximum impact on their listeners. So sticking with the theme of choices, a speaker has to make decisions about how to order their ideas, decisions about the best way to design and organize a message. I like to use the metaphor of arranging furniture in a room for the first time. You bring in the furniture and then you move things around until everything seems like it's in the right place and the arrangement makes sense. And just like with furniture, there are norms in public speaking that can guide you so you don't have to reinvent the wheel. You may already be familiar with a traditional introduction body conclusion arrangement. And you'll often see three points in the body section. We use this design a lot because it's easy to follow for listeners. A good arrangement will help your listeners absorb your message. And there really aren't right or wrong answers, but there are some common time-tested practices that you can use. In a persuasive message, for instance, once I'm in the body of the message, I usually structure my main points around first the problem, second the solution, and third the benefits. Problem, solution, benefits. Those are conventional main points for a persuasive message. That has a natural persuasive logic to it. So arrangement also involves making choices about how you order each smaller chunk of information within those points. So should I lead with a statistic or should I lead with a quotation? What would flow better? When I'm watching a speaker who is really hard to follow, it's usually because they needed to spend more time really nailing down their arrangement to their presentation. So it was designed in an orderly way. I think the best way to make these decisions is to practice out loud a few times near the beginning of your preparation. Sometimes ideas look good on paper, but they feel choppy when you say it out loud. So talking it through aloud 
will help you make those adjustments so the ideas will flow naturally from one point to the next and build that persuasive momentum that speakers want. These are all choices a speaker has to make about the arrangement of their message. Third, style. This describes the language choices you make. Language, one of the key ways that we establish the level of formality and language conveys emotion. Your style shapes the whole tone of your message. The goal is to make choices on your style that fits the speaking occasion. You would typically decide this in advance as you're preparing. So for example, a human resources manager who is presenting to encourage listeners about their 401k investment options might take a really plain information-driven style, like a teacher. If you're trying to raise awareness, however, about a really important issue like child trafficking, you might take a more urgent and emphatic and emotionally charged style and use of language. So your style includes the extent to which you also artfully use language poetically and use rhetorical language and techniques. Those are all part of style. And it depends on your audience. Those choices are driven by the occasion, the reason you were asked to speak, your strengths as a speaker, and lots of other variables. I have sometimes seen speakers fall flat because their style didn't fit the occasion right. You've probably seen movie clips where a wedding toast went really badly, like the best man or the maid of honor tries to be funny or roast the new couple with crass jokes and coarse language. It's horrifying, but also funny in a movie. But in real life, we need to learn how to read the room, as they say. That expression is about how the speaker makes choices when they're asked to do a wedding toast, for example. You might want to make a choice that strikes a romantic or maybe sentimental tone. In the end, it's up to you as the speaker to read the situation beforehand, make some decisions about what style best fits the purposes of that occasion. Number four is memory. As the expression goes, you want to know your stuff. This process starts behind the scenes in the days and even hours before you speak. The term memory describes the speaker's ability to recall what they plan to say. It takes time, practice, discipline to learn and internalize your message and all of the information in it. But the term memory doesn't necessarily mean memorizing everything word for word. Your choices about how to recall your message matter and most presentations are not memorized word for word. That would be extremely boring for our listeners. And I don't recommend you get stuck reading directly from your notes most of the time. That will also sound really robotic. I almost always prefer to use an extemporaneous approach where I do have notes, but they're limited to a concise outline, just talking points, really. Memory means getting to a place where I have learned my message, so I have a clear command over the content. I, I know I'm ready to speak as I practice. Let's say I only need to glance at my notes every once in a while to see what comes next. I wanna be prepared enough to improvise and be spontaneous here and there. I wanna be able to expand on some points, maybe cut some other points out based upon what's happening in the moment. I wanna have a firm grasp on the content so I can handle Q&A afterward really well. So if you can check all those boxes when you're practicing, you're in good shape in the category of memory to stand up and speak. And number five, delivery. This gets most of the attention typically, but delivery is the word we use to describe the actual moment when you're presenting, when you're standing up to speak. Your delivery brings together the other four canons and brings them to life. And since you've already crafted most of your message, delivery involves typically your nonverbals like eye contact, gesture, postures, movement, your tone of voice, volume, how fast or slow you speak, and how clearly you articulate and emphasize your words. Some people say that these behaviors shouldn't matter. They say we should only be judged by the substance of our message. Well, my response is usually this. Well, have you ever had a teacher who was smart but boring or smart but distracting? That's proof that delivery matters. If your delivery is at its best, it will emphasize your ideas and enhance the sense of urgency of your message. If your delivery is at its worst, your nonverbals will be a huge distraction that decrease the impact of your message. And keeping the theme of 
choices in mind. You have delivery choices. Should I stand? Should I sit? Should I walk around? Should I speak really loudly or keep it more subdued? Should I gesture? How much? That's why when I practice, I practice my delivery as if I was standing up in front of listeners. I pretend. I speak loudly. I gesture. I act as if I'm making eye contact, even though the room is empty. I even practice with my visual aids. I don't memorize any of these movements. I just get really comfortable practicing like this. So I'm more likely to be engaging and dynamic when I actually present. I keep my practice as realistic as possible to enhance my delivery. One final tip is that for a new message, I recommend practicing out loud and keeping it real about 10 times before you stand up to speak. As I've said, 95% of how well a presentation goes is worked out beforehand as you practice. Practicing 10 times will clearly make your delivery skills stronger, but also allow you to go back and make revisions and smooth out any kinks that remain in the other four canons. But don't practice to sound perfect. Practice to make progress. Question of the day, which of these five canons do you generally need the most work on? To me, the five canons of rhetoric are an underused framework for understanding and improving our public speaking. I'd like to take the time again to thank Professor Peter Marson for his help on this. Till next time, thanks, God bless, and I will see you soon.